Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome back to the PMF IS Current Affairs Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and this in this video we are going to discuss the last 20 questions from the test number 2. That is from 81 to 100. So let us get started and let's see what we all have to discuss and learn from these quality questions. Question number 81 was with respect to the vultures, uh, different different species and then you have the IUCN status. Very very common kind of question because uh, you will find these kind of questions uh, in terms of biodiversity and UPSC is always going to trick. This is a very serious advice for all of you. In these kind of questions with respect to the IUCN status, UPSC is 100% going to play with you and I have never seen any question which is always correct and all kind of correct. So you have to be a little bit careful. Since it is specifically talking about the vultures. Like in India, we have more than eight or uh, nine varieties of the of the vultures that we have. The question was asking very specifically about the three, about the white rampant vulture, the Indian vulture and the Egyptian vulture. OK, so let us say that we uh, of course for this, you have to be uh, factually correct. I mean, there is no uh, guesswork that you can do. But at least one thing I can see here that, you know, at least we are aware that, that in India, Vultures are really struggling a lot with this with their survivals and it is all because of the kind of uh, one of the major reasons is the antibiotics that we give to the livestock and uh, after when the when the when the vultures they consume those uh, uh, livestock their uh, their dead bodies we have the problem of kidney failure with the vultures so that indiscriminate use of antibiotics in livestock has contributed to the uh, uh, dying of the vultures in India. Since in India vulture situation is really alarming, how can they still be endangered? They are supposed to be critically endangered, right? At least going by that logic, I can see, okay, this, this doesn't see right to me. This is absolutely incorrect. And similarly, uh, the one that we have the, in, in Egypt, we do not have these kind of problems. Egyptian vultures are not critically endangered. They are only endangered. These are critically endangered. The Egyptians are endangered only. So at least these two combinations are wrong. I mean, of course, this is a factual question. I understand. But if I have no choice but to guess that even in the guesswork, I can use my knowledge of the current affairs because I we have read about these uh, vulture stories a lot. And then you can take a guess. Now, only problem is we are not really sure if the white rampant vulture, vulture is critically endangered or not. Right. For that, you need to have a little bit more information. But at least we know what what to eliminate in this particular question. So there are nine species in India I, I was talking about and out of them six are resident which actually live in India. Three are the migratory species. They simply come and they, they go back after their functioning. So when talking about the white rampant vultures, uh, yes, they are very, very common in the Gangetic plains of India. They are native to the South and Southeast Asia and they are critically endangered. So the first combination was right actually. And of course, now they are popular. They are critically endangered. Why? Because they are also suffering from the decline in their population due to the kidney failures by this diclofenic poisoning, which is an antibiotic for the livestock that I have already told you. And similarly, uh, for the for Indian vultures, Indian vultures are also critically endangered. They are native to India, Pakistan and Nepal. Uh, they are also suffering from the same problem of kidney failures. But that kind of problem is not with the Egyptian vultures because they are very well distributed. They are widely distributed from Iberian Peninsula to the North Africa. So their population is still better in position than comparative to other uh, populations. So that's why they are endangered and they're not critical. So that's going by that particular logic. Now you have the answer. It is supposed to be only one pair is correct. I know this is this question was a bit med of medium level. But uh, I, again, by by utilizing our knowledge of the current affairs, I could have eliminated that. So yes, I would say do risk, do risk it uh, with some logic applied. The answer has to be one only. The next question was with respect to the debt for nature swap. Okay, let's let's assume that you have absolutely no idea uh, about this scheme. By the way, this is a very very interesting scheme. Recently uh, uh, started by one of the countries of Africa, and um, the name itself says a lot. The name is saying debt for nature swap. Swap is something. You are, you know, you give this and uh, I want and give another thing in return. So when you are exchanging the two things, when you are giving something, taking something that is give and take is called a swap agreement, right? 
we have swapping in terms of uh, territories, we have swapping in terms of currencies, but this very unique name is called debt for nature swap. Just by applying the logic of this name, that means that I'm going to negotiate my debt. There is some negotiation with respect to debt and in, in uh, return of that, I have to do something for the nature. Something, something is like what we can, uh, uh, what we can get from this particular information. Now, now look at this, it says the primary objective is fostering the environment conservation sustainability with simultaneously reducing the debt. If I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking from a very layman perspective, if I have absolutely no idea, I can still see, okay, this looks pretty fine. The name itself is saying this, what is in statement number one. Statement number two is little bit problematic. Why? It says this particular uh, kind of swap benefits only the creditor. If it, it benefits only the creditor, why would debt, why would the debtor ever accept that kind of agreement? Normally the swapping agreement is agreed. The normal swap agreements is where you have a win-win situation for both. Some debtors also will get the benefit and the creditors will get the benefit too. So simply without even knowing the detail of the, uh, of this particular kind of uh, question, I can solve it. I can solve it with little bit of the common sense. So right answer has to be A. But now getting to the details of this because this scheme is actually important. So you need to be aware of that. So what happens basically guys, uh, uh, this debt for nature swap scheme, it actually allows the heavily indebted developing countries of the world so that they can uh, like, there are so many developing countries and especially the least developed countries right now, which are in a kind of debt trap. They are in a, uh, they are heavily indebted. They have lots of loans, lot of credit on their head and they are not in a position to pay back. Okay. Now they must have taken these loans from the developed world. Now this agreement, nature for swap agreement is simple, where the developing countries say, please, you know, adjust our debt. We are not in a position to pay back your debt. And let us say if, if uh, there is a country who has a hundred rupees of debt, let's assume. So what this developing country would say, I'm not in a position to give back the hundred rupees. I can only give you 50 rupees. That is the only thing that, that I have right now. Now the developed country would say, okay, fine. You give me 50. That's not, not that's still not bad but you have to promise that I'm going to wave off your 50 rupees. I'm going to wave off this debt, the remaining part, but you have to promise that you will be investing in the environment conservation projects that you would be investing in your biodiversity conservation, that you have to invest your local currency into some climate change projects. So that is a win-win situation. The developed countries are also concerned with the uh, conservation of the natural resources, right? So that is the, that is the kind of agreement you will have with these two, uh, with these two things. And what is the benefit of that from, from both uh, pr prospects? If you look, of course, both will, both are going to have some benefits. What benefits uh, look at that way. So here the creditors, the, uh, which are the creditors, the developed countries, developed countries can benefit from this by, because ultimately since though they are waving off the debt, but, but again, they are making sure that that particular country is going to uh, invest in their climate finance goals. You are encouraging the developed, the developing countries that they are taking care of the climate because it is very, very important for, even for the developed countries, the climate change is a glo global problem. And to stop the climate change, to at least mitigate the climate change, every single country's contribution is important. So, and, and you know that the, the developed countries, they, they already have a huge financial burden uh, uh, on their head because ultimately every developing country says you are responsible for climate change because every developed country is seen as a villain in climate change. So now you will have some goodwill. Since you are waiving off the debt of the country, that will give you, that, that will actually give you a, 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 a you know, image makeover kind of thing. And you can, you also have a chance of strengthening the diplomatic ties with that particular least developed country. And whereas of course the debtor country have everything to be happy about, ultimately their external debt will get reduced. Now they will have more money. They can actually use that particular amount for their own development priorities. They can promote climatic actions through domestic investment. So it is a win-win kind of situation. So definitely going by that particular logic, my answer has to be one only. Okay. Now, which, which particular country has started it? 
uh, as far as my knowledge says it is i think this uh, uh, the country is gabon the gabon is the uh, is the african country which actually started this scheme i as far as i know it is gabon uh, please do please do cross check once but i think it's gabon who has start who has established a 500 million dollar fund for the debt for uh, climate change kind of swap okay next question you have with question number 83 very fact based question now this is a question which 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 is very tough to uh, to be honest because it is very specifically asking about rule 267 of the rajya sabha rule 176 of the rajya sabha if very very specifically it is asking what is exactly written in that way now these questions are tricky because if you have read them or and you know about them so definitely it is easy for you to recall but sometimes because you read so many things it, it is sometimes become difficult to remember the particular rules unless and until they were in the news for some quite good time or they were they were in the news for some bigger reasons otherwise it is very impossible there are hundreds of rules of lok sabha rajya sabha you can't remember everything so these two are really tricky part now but but look at the second statement second statement forget about the rule doesn't bother about the rule simply say that you know any rule of the rajya sabha it require the consent of the chairman motion is to put to vote only if the chair allows to do so makes sense right i mean everything uh, that happens inside the rajya sabha is after the approval by given by the chairman so second seems correct that is okay but i have problem with the first and the third but i'll i'll explain you what exactly these rules are but you can say right now they both are being swapped so in general the second and third first and third are wrong it's a tough question i would say it's a tough question you should not risk it do not risk because it's very specific now how what you need to know about this question about the rule specifically now you can see clearly the rule 176 of the rajya sabha is actually about the short term duration that does not last for more than 2.5 hours and rule 267 specifically is about suspension of the rules in relation to the business which is enlisted in the agenda to debate on issue of national importance if there's something of national importance comes up that all other business is set aside under the rule 267 mostly mostly the uh, lead uh, the opposition leaders you know they invoke this particular rule because they uh, they have to talk more on the national importance than the normal agenda so mostly this 267 is invoked and requested by the opposition leaders okay now these two are these two are important and if you look at the question of course the the uh, these two are being swapped so one is wrong two of three is wrong the second being correct Okay, now these are fact based questions of course in your PDF we have very very uh, uh, you know we have clearly given the two rules you can read about them uh, something you have to cram I would say you have to memorize no other option for that but question 84 was very interesting question 84 was about the Kaveri water dispute tribunal leave everything about uh, leave everything aside just think of the river Kaveri now, I'm sure you're good with your geography and you know at least the bigger rivers of India Kaveri is one of the major rivers of India now it says the central government has established a tribunal for uh, uh, water dispute of the Kaveri 1990 okay I, I have no idea maybe 1990 could be other year also but at least look at the statement that involves the name of the states it says the dispute of the Kaveri is among Karnataka, Kerala, Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra. Does, does Kaveri even enters Maharashtra? Does Kaveri has to do anything with Maharashtra? Absolutely no. Kaveri river originates in Karnataka, flows through Kerala, Tamil Nadu and the fourth party is Puducherry. So only by utilizing your knowledge of geography, Indian geography, you can say, okay, fine, this looks, this is, this is totally bizarre. Maharashtra has nothing to do. Maharashtra has interest in Krishna river, Godavari river, but not with the Kaveri river, right? So straight away, I can eliminate this particular question. Now by eliminating it, at least I am left with only 50-50 kind of chance. And by, by, by seeing that, at least I am sure that my option number three has to be correct at any cost because both options has number three. In 2018, Supreme Court delivered the, uh, this verdict and granting so-so amount of the Karnataka, that is fine. Okay, fine. Look at the second statement. Second statement, do, if, even if you are not aware of this uh, verdict, even if you are not aware of the tribunal, first of all, apply your logic. Why would government make any water dispute tribunal? What should be the objective? 
government of india constituted this uh, water management authority for securing compliance implementation of the award yes obviously this has to be correct because that is probably the only thing why the water dip dispute tribunals are made and then you have certain authorities to implement that award so that is very common common sense kind of question so now by simply looking at these two i am sure that two and three has to be correct I was not aware of the fourth, but now I have figured out my answer is uh, 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 answer is B, and the fourth one is wrong because these water allocation agreement is is going to be the same for the next fifteen years, not the ten years. But even if I don't know, and I was able to figure out the two and three, I can still get my answer right, and that is the objective of prelims question. You do not have to be knowing everything, but you are you should be in a position to eliminate what is not required. i would say this question was medium but definitely something that you should attempt with a common sense right so the answer has to be b in this particular case i'm not going by more of the details because that what exactly is there in your pdf there's nothing much to explain question 85 that we have in front of us was with respect to two very important drugs we have the ketoprofen and ecaclofenac these two were in news recently because these two drugs were banned by the government of india and why they were banned because they had the same impact on the vultures like the drug i mentioned was diclofenac the same the same diclofenac kind of impact these two ketoprofen and ecaclofenac both of them are inflammatory drugs used to give to the livestock for for a pain treatment but both of them were impacting the vultures of india so that's why they were both banned and they they are in the same categories as diclofenac so they are uh, definitely not about genetic engineering they are not about the sports science they are with respect to environmental concern impact on pharmaceuticals then they are of course not anything for may pain management the answer has to be b because ketoprofen and ecaclofenac are banned for the sake of safety of the vulture they have they are proven to be toxic to the vultures guys okay and they were banned these two are non steroid uh, steroid uh, steroidal anti inflammatory drugs now been banned in india uh, which particular ministry has banned the ministry of health and family welfare and you look at look at this particular list you have the names here which are confirmed toxic there are other names other than diclofenac and ketoprofen ecaclofenac there is one more name called as nimesulide even nimesulide falls in the same category of confirmed toxic for the vultures there are some other drugs which are toxic not confirmed one this the research is still going on like we have the car uh, carpo the car carprofen and the uh, flunixin these two are still toxic but not yet banned but these four are clearly banned confirmed toxic that we have in our country question number 86 is with respect to a particular century called as the holon gapper gibbon century in india you have to figure out which statement is correct now first you need to know a little bit about this uh, uh, century then we'll come back to the main question so this particular century uh, this particular gibbon century it contains india's only ape india's only ape is the hulock gibbon that you can see uh, on your screen it is the only ape that we have in in our india and this particular century is a home to these particular apes india in total has 20 species of gibbons uh, uh, and sorry uh, not india uh, india has only one in total there are 20 species india has only one hulock gibbon now this you see this particular sanctuary is in the state of the assam and it is it is a part of evergreen forest located in the jorhat district of the assam so two things are important but please remember this particular sanctuary contains north eastern india's only nocturnal primate there is a nocturnal only nocturnal primate nocturnal means uh, which are active during the night nocturnals are those animals which are active during the night and they are very they are they almost sleep and they are inactive during the day time nocturnals are those but india's only nocturnal in the north east and and this particular century is bengal slow iris which which lies in the vulnerable category okay now look at the question guys now you will see the problem with the statement number 3 okay the, th the first two are absolutely okay the third is problematic western hulock gibbon is not the only nocturnal it is the bengal eastern iris which is nocturnal so of course this question i would say 
it's a tough one uh, you should not risk it because there is absolutely nothing you can eliminate in this i would say you should skip it's a tough question hard question uh, the names are not very familiar not very famous so avoid taking risk in this particular case the real information we have just shared with you the next question we have is with respect to the hawaiian islands now i think they are the most famous islands uh, island archipelago that we have read in our geography books right so hawaiian are the archipelago of the eight major volcanic islands and yes hawaiian are volcanic they are famous for their volcanic nature which particular kind of volcanism the hot spot volcanism we we have read about the hot spot volcanism hawaiians are the best example but the problem in the statement is are they located in atlantic ocean no absolutely not even if you have seen one time the map of the world clearly you know the hawaiians are located in the pacific ocean they are also technically the part of united states of america they are under the administrative control of usa so hawaiians lies in the pacific ocean not the atlantic so clearly this this one thing seems wrong to me now look at the second statement if, if you even if you have heard the name hawaiian you are in a position to get the answer of the second one you know they are they are uh, uh, volcanic islands so largest scale wildfire sweeping us state of hawaii have become deadliest united states wildfire in more than century yeah looks very obvious because if something is very much volcanic activity these kind of events are very obvious with the common sense you can say okay this looks quite fine i mean very very easy question very simple nothing much to worry about so answer has to be b okay now look at the position and and for for god's sake uh, you should be aware of very good uh, you know the isle there are good chances of you getting the question on the islands of pacific uh, indian and atlantic because Uh, upsc is very much interested and specifically when it comes to the islands of the pacific very very important all three the polynesia the micronesia and the melanesia these three are the tiny group of islands uh, all all three lie in the pacific very very important they are considered to be sub regions of the oceania oceania which already has australia and new zealand as the two main uh, constituents along with all these mini mini islands hawaiian is the one that lies in the north pacific you can see on the map as well guys okay now going by the question number 88 what was the question number 88 now this question was with respect to the hazardous waste rule 2016 and you you are supposed to take care of both the statement 1 and 2 okay fine let's let's assume let's let's see that you have not read this these rules okay now instead of instead of getting panic oh, i have not read about anything about these rules just try to read the statements carefully the term is with respect to the hazardous waste hazardous waste as you can figure out with the name they are not good for our environment they are hazardous in nature they now they should not come to india hazardous waste is something which we should refrain from something which which will bother our environment right look at the first statement it says no country can export hazardous waste to india's for final disposal of course why would india allow any country to dump their hazardous waste to us the statement looks fine second statement says india only import hazardous waste for recycling and reuse and for other utilization even if india will allow some countries to uh, you know give us their hazardous waste we will do that only for the sake of recycling and reusing otherwise it will damage our environment so I have no idea about these rules but these two statements look pretty much okay and they also explain each other well so my logical answer has to be a it this question is bit medium but I would still say to risk it because both statements are simple and actually signifies the importance of the rules now this answer has to be a now if I if I explain you little bit now then you will get to know that in 2016 India has uh, India has got these rules with respect to the hazardous waste. So uh, hazardous waste and other waste are the two categories in which the rules classify the waste materials. Hazardous waste as the name suggests they are something of very serious concern but there are other waste other waste includes your waste tire paper waste metal scrap etc 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 and uh, as per the statement number 1 when it comes to the rules of import export of course no country is allowed to 
dump their waste into India as a final product. We do not want that. Even if we, we are buying that uh, hazardous waste, it is only for the sake of recycling. And these rules specifies the procedure of importing that too, so that our environment does not get hurt in the long end. Now here are some very important points. The waste, the silk waste exporters now being exempted from this particular rules. Now anybody who is dealing with the silk waste do not require permission of our Ministry of Environment. And similarly, electrical electronic component manufactured in and exported from India, if found defected, can now be imported back to the country without taking the permission. These are some two rules, important exceptional rules. Otherwise, everything needs to be done as per these rules. So I think very simple question, something you can attempt. Then we have question number 89 and that was about the Forest Conservation Amendment Act 2023. Normally, we, have, we, we always read this uh, uh, Forest uh, Conservation Act and the major forest act that we always read is about 1980 Act. This is, so far this was the standard act. Everything related to the forest was always referred to this particular 1980 Act. But now look, we have got an amended act in 2023, okay? Again, going by the logic, if you already have a, have a you know, a rule, regulation, an act, and there is some amendment being brought, probably what could be the reason? Think, because you can't skip every question. Think about that logic. Why any uh, act is going to be amended? Something which was there in 1980, of course, it's been, it's been around 40, 44 years. So we need to have some upgradation of that. What upgradation can be there? First question, first statement says, the name was changed. Uh, the name of the act was now changed to one Sanrakshan Evam Sam Vardhan Adhiniyam to that 1980 to reflect potential of its uh, provisions. So now, now you know in the last couple of years we have seen it's been a trend that every act of the past is now being renamed and it is given some Hindi name, right? That is a standard practice we have seen. The same happened with the uh, Indian Penal Code. Now it has become Bharati Nyay Sahita. Now, given the record of this particular government, it looks like, yes, this is probably possible, okay? This looks quite possible for us. I'm not saying this is correct, but this looks quite possible. Similarly, look at the second statement. It says that these amendments add more activities to the restriction of the de-reservation uh, de list, like zoo and safaris and all that. Of course, any amendment is going to do more, uh, 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 you know, more favor for the people of those uh, of the forest. So by default, we are going to de-reserve the activities. We are allowing the greater role of the central government, the kind of uh, trend which is going on these days. So both statements look correct to me. Now, if I go by the explanation and, and then we'll come back to the question. So look what has really happened. So this particular Forest Conservation Act 2023 aims to boost India's forest. Now, the major aim of this act again is uh, that India should have a 33% of the total land area, 33% has to be forest cover. Right now, how much do we have? We have somewhere around 22-23%, but that this is the target of increasing our, the forest cover of India. And also, we have a target of uh, creating an additional carbon sink of up to 3 billion tons of the carbon dioxide by 2030. Now, these two are the major objectives. These are the two major objectives of this uh, newly amended act. Of course, before that we have 1980 Forest Conservation Act. The name now has been changed, and you have seen that. Okay. Now, in this after in this particular rule, the now the government of India may exclude any survey from the restrictions on de-reservation. The powers has been changed now by the government of India, and of course now recently we are adding more activities for de-reservation list. Now, there would be less control on the forest by the, by the by the local people. And the government is now allowing more and more activities uh, uh, like for the sake of zoo and safari, ecotourism facility. Sylvie pasture is basically with respect to trees. Sylvie pasture, if you, if you have read about the agroforestry, Sylvie pasture is more about growing the trees as a, as a part of the agroforestry. Okay? So government is allowing these kind of activities now these days. So uh, the answer has to be A, both A, uh, 1 and 2. Uh, I would say that, that of course this question this question looks uh, tough to you but you should still risk it given the kind of trend 
which is there by applying bit of common sense you can still take a risk of that question. It is not that difficult that is something you cannot uh, attempt at all. Now you have the next question which is a very technical question of Indian economy. The, there are four statements and you are supposed to figure out the merits, the, what, what are the merits of the fiscal deficit. There are four activities given. Okay. Before I tell you anything about it, first you should be aware what is the meaning of fiscal deficit. To put in a very simple words, the word fiscal deficit means when the government is spending more, when government's expenditure is way more than its total revenue that it is collecting. If I am earning 100 rupees, I am spending 120, that 20 rupees is my deficit. So government expenditure when it, when it is more than its uh, uh, revenue, this is called fiscal deficit. Okay? If you know this much, that you means that now, okay, now that means government finance is in negative state of economy. We have negative state of economy because now the government is under some kind of debt. That is the word of fiscal deficit. Now possible what possible merits you can think of? Why would government do that? Why any government would like to expend, would like to spend more than it is earning? One reason is when it, when its objective is to stimulate the economic activity. Well, that is something which almost every country is doing these days. Why I would spend more? Because I really need to put money into the economy. So as to generate the demand, I need to increase the consumption and that is what exactly every government is doing. Okay? So first statement looks correct. That is the reason why many governments today, they are running in fiscal deficits. And at the same time, when you are expending, when you are spending more, your expenditure is higher than the revenue collections, probably you are doing it for the sake of increasing the investments. So that India, in India we can have more infrastructure. We want to invest so that the demand jumps up and so will be the manufacturing and everything else, right? So of course, these two are the benefits. These are the merits of fiscal deficit that I can think of. This is very logical. This is very logical. I, I need not to be an expert of economy. By these two common sense, I can figure out the two looks okay. Please read the second, the second and the fourth statement. Now, if, if anything is reducing the investor confidence, do you, do you see this as a merit? Is, is it looking like if, if uh, investors confidence are reducing, India is not going to get good amount of investments, FDIs. The foreign direct investments are going to get impacted. If anything is reducing the investor confidence, the new money is not going to be pumped in Indian economy. Does it look like any merit? merit? It doesn't look like any merit. If interest rates are increased, is it a merit part? No. If interest rates would be high, we are going to have, we are going to have the credit. We are going to receive the credit. Any loan that we take is going to be costly for us because we have to pay more interest on that. So technically to solve this question, I do not need to get into the more of the details of fiscal deficit. Only if I'm okay with the definition, I can still figure out that which statement looks like a merit or which statement doesn't look like a merit. For many people, this question was a bit tough, but I would say it's a medium level question and you must, must attempt it by your common sense. You do not have to be an economic expert. You simply can see the, the focus has to be on the merit. See, all the four, I would say all the four are actually related to fiscal deficit, but the question was not which of them are related. The question was with respect to which is the merit. What is the benefit that we are getting? Fiscal deficit has benefit also. Fiscal deficit has some negative impact also. Okay. Now talking about the benefits that you that you should be talking about. The, it always stimulates the economy, increase the investment. It will support the social welfare program because now government has more spending capacity. Government can spend more. So obviously it will be spending on social welfare. It can act as a counter cyclical policy. And mainly it is done for the long term investment purpose. What are the demerits? What are the, what are the negatives of fiscal deficit? It always leads to inflation. Increased interest rates will increase. So I am going to get a costly credit. I am not going to get loan easily. It will reduce my conf investors confidence. It will crowd out the private investments. Private investors are not going to get the money easily because why? Because the interest rates are so high. And, and these are and these are some relatable problems that we have. One thing I would like you to remember, 
every fiscal deficit is always calculated as a percentage of the GDP. Now, just to give you a bit more information on fiscal deficit, as per the FRBM Act of India, Fiscal Responsibility Budget Ma uh, uh, Management, this is, this is a very important act in Indian economy. This recommends that the ideal fiscal deficit should be uh, approximately around 3% FD is okay. Approximately 3% fiscal deficit is okay because a uh, government like India or a country like India needs to spend more than, than actually it earns. So this is the ideal fiscal deficit we have. How much we have right now? The, as, as far as the budget is concerned, right now India's fiscal deficit is somewhere around 5.9. The government is, is targeting to bring it down to 5.5 and 4, 4.5 by the next 2 or 3 years. Okay, important. Question number 91 is very interesting, important, at the same time tricky and tough question. Why? It says the cyber laws are under the 7th schedule. 7th schedule, you have the union list. You have the state list and the concurrent list. And it says section 66A, very specifically it mentioned, of the IT Act deals with the punishment of the cyber terrorism. I would say this is a very tough question. The question looks very easy guys, but is actually very tough. Because the cyber laws are not part of any list. Cyber laws actually are part of the residuary powers. Now, residuary powers are those unexpected situations where only the central government has an authority to make a law upon. They are not part of 7th schedule. And very interestingly, with respect to cyber terrorism of the IT Act, there is a section 66F, not A, for the IT Act about the cyber terrorism. I mean, this is very specific. I do not expect you to remember this deep. Even, I mean, there is no scope of guesswork, anything like that. This kind of question you should skip if you have no idea. Because the question actually makes you, you know, a bit more greedy that you should solve it. But actually something you should not be putting your hands upon. So cyber laws are residuary. They are not part of the list. And as far as section 66A is concerned, it was, act, it was in the IT Act. It was uh, with respect to penalizing the, if you are, if somebody is sending any offensive messages through a communication device, he or she was supposed to be penalized. But very famous case in 2015, it was Shreya Singhal versus Union of India, where actually Supreme Court struck down section 66A of the, in, of, of this particular act, because it was actually violating the freedom of speech guaranteed under the fundamental right, article 19. So right now 66A does not even exist. Cyber terrorism is dealt with 66F of the IT Act. Now, now we have also got an amendment of that. Now India has got its new uh, IT Act 2023. So I, I recommend you to do read that particular list as well. That is again very important for you to read. Okay. The next question is again a question on economy. Now very specifically it is asking about the primary deficit. See guys, in your syllabus, there are many deficit. The there is a budgetary deficit, there is a fiscal deficit that we have just seen, there is a revenue deficit, effective revenue deficit, primary deficit, so many are there. So it is better we first learn about them and then only we can, we will discuss this particular question, which is asking the primary deficit. So one deficit is called the budget deficit. Budget deficit means when government spending more money that actually it can collect in taxes and revenue is called a budget deficit. Just compare it straight with the fiscal deficit because we already have done that. When government is spending more money on all its activity, including both revenue generating, non-revenue generating tech activities, then actually it collects. It is fiscal deficit. You see, even there is something more. Fiscal is the largest deficit that you can have. Because budget and fiscal are look very close, but actually they are not. Budget deficit is only about the taxes and the revenues. But here the fiscal is about both revenue generating and non-revenue generating activities. Of course, it is wider, it is wider than the budgetary deficit. So always, uh, pre, uh, you know, revise these two together. Now look at the next one called the revenue deficit. The name itself says a lot. Revenue deficit, government spending more money on its revenue generating activities like tax collection and all then actually it is collecting the revenue from those activities. If I am spending more money for revenue, generate, uh, revenue generation, then actually I am collecting the revenue. That part is called revenue deficit. 
and what is what compare this with the effective revenue generate everything is same government spending more money on its revenue gener generation than it, it is collecting but there is only one thing which is excluded for effective revenue deficit we exclude one particular thing and that is the grant for the creation of the capital assets sometimes the central government give grant to the states for the sake of capital assets that particular grant part is to be excluded and that is why in many many cases economists do refer uh, do actually prefer utilizing the term effective revenue deficit because grant is something which is which you are now spending but at one point it is going to give you long term benefits and that is why there is a difference in revenue and effective revenue and in that we are excluding one particular part and then comes the question which is about the primary deficit primary deficit means government spend more money on the activities now you have you can compare it with the fiscal deficit government spend more money on the activities than it actually collects in revenue from all sources but again there is one exclusion while calculating the primary deficit i have to exclude the interest payment you know in 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 uh, in, uh, uh, in this particular budget interest payment is the largest chunk of expenditure i mean 24% of the government expenditure is expected to go just in the interest payment all the loan and credit that indian government has taken so far so 24% expenditure is going to go into the interest payment that so so that is why it it does not really reflects the way government is because government has no choice but to pay the interest right and that is why to understand the real uh, expenditure process of the government it is advisable rather than fiscal you should actually be focusing on the primary deficit so that the interest payment part is left aside because that always confuses you how the government is spending because this is something you can't you don't have a choice doesn't matter which government is in power you have to pay your interest payment right that is where the game of the primary deficit comes it exclude the those interest payment now please look at the question once again you have to figure out which is about the primary deficit the first statement says government spend more money revenue generating like tax than it collects in the is it primary no this is not primary this is this is actually the revenue deficit the government spend more money revenue excluding grant for creation this this particular looks like an effective revenue deficit this is effective revenue deficit look at the first one government spend more money than it collects in the taxes and the revenue which this with this looks more of a budget budgetary deficit and then we have the right answer as b the primary deficit is about spending more money on the activities excluding the interest payment for every primary deficit please or you have to exclude the interest payment that is the key to figure out the answer this question was tough i would say very technical question and you cannot take a risk in the exam okay you you have no choice but to know it if it is too tough you have no idea please do not risk it do not attempt it better you skip but this again is a very basic topic so i would recommend you to guys to prepare it well before you go uh, to your exam okay this is a very basic question next question is with respect to the apida okay now let, now for one particular let's say let's assume that even you have not heard of the term apida apida is agricultural and processed food export uh, products export authority apida now it looks like that you know this agriculture processed food is going to be under ministry of agriculture looks like and that's what the question is also going to trick you but you don't have to focus on the word agriculture everything everything that has agriculture in it need not to be under the agriculture ministry here it is about agriculture and processed food export products export authority the keyword is export how you are going to export those processed food and agriculture items export means trade trade means business business is commerce so technically which ministry has to be there ministry has to be ministry of commerce and industry okay eliminate it this way so even i am not aware of that but simply by making a little bit of common sense i can exclude this first statement then if you read the next two this looks very obvious to you if you have any export authority in india what should be the main objective of any export authority main objective should be to, to promote export the scheduled products right yes that is the that is the case and second is a bit uh, 
little bit difficult, uh, tricky, but you can still see that. What export authority is supposed to do? It will oversee accreditation of the certification bodies for uh, a organic exports under this particular program as a national accreditation secretary. Yes, looks fine to me. If like I can still take a risk on that, no? It looks difficult, but I can still take a risk. By normal applying my common sense, my answer has to be B. And that is exactly what UPSC prelims is all about. It is about your presence of mind. It is about how you actually, up, uh, uh, you know, approach that particular question okay when you when you talk about the apida yes you have to you have to make sure you remember for the next exam that apida is a statutory body under this particular ministry of commerce right it was established 1985 and this is that this is the top body apex body for every agricultural export promotion in our country okay and what are the main functions so now you know the main functions of the of the apida uh, here is a complete list I mean, it is about development of the industries. When it comes to registration of the persons as exporter, it, it is also done by PIDA. It is also talking about fixing the standard specifications of the products that needs to be exported. Uh, when it comes to inspecting the things, it is again the PIDA's responsibility. How we can improve the packaging and scheduled products, that is again the responsibility. And also improving marketing of the scheduled products. What, are, what exactly is the scheduled product? When I use the word scheduled product, it actually includes fruit, vegetable, meat, dairy product, alcoholic, non-alcoholic beverage. That is exactly what it means to be a scheduled product in India. In addition to that, APIDA also does one more task that is monitoring the sugar import. Other than the export, everything is to be exported. But please, this is a star mark, something new information. It is also going to monitor the sugar imports in India, not just the export. But import part is also taken care of by the APIDA. The next question is with respect to the ethanol. Probably one of the most famous biofuel that we are talking today. Ethanol is a kind of biofuel. We all are talking about it. Ethanol produced from the fermentation of sugar and starches. Yes, if the question would be sugar and starches only, then it would be incorrect. Because you know that biofuels are four generation biofuels. If anything is we are fermenting sugar and starch, that is one first and second generation, that is fine. Because then you have some other things as well. So yes, ethanol is by fermentation of this first and uh, sugar and starches. Now, the second, sec first is correct. The second is not correct. Second, why it is not correct? Because you first need to know about the ethanol blending program. Targets you have to be very specific about. You, when you talk about the ethanol guys, ethanol is basically 99% pure alcohol and ethanol blending means then I am going to mix it with my petrol as a fuel I can use it. Why do we do that? There is a very logical benefit. If let's say, if let us say in one liter of, I am using one liter of petrol, of course one liter of petrol is going to cost me more money. It is going to cost me approximately 100 rupees. Now instead of that, if I am going to go with the ethanol blending, and let's say I'm doing 20% 20, 20 ethanol blending. So my 800 ml is going to be petrol and remaining 200 ml is going to be ethanol. Like let, let's for say for, for say for this I'm paying 80 rupees, but for the ethanol that we are we have, it is it is very cheap. Let's say five rupees or 10 rupees. So I'm going still going to save money. Uh, the petrol prices would be less. India's import has will, will also get reduced. Because if I am going to mix my uh, petrol with, the, with ethanol, of course, I, I am also going to cut my imports. It will cut my imports of the crude oil. I will save my forex money. I will be less dependent on the imports. I will be saving money. Plus, ethanol is also a clean fuel. It is also very clean because when it burns, it, it literally uh, uh, gives you back only the water, water vapor. That's it. So there is no pollution. It's a very clean fuel. So it gives us multiple benefits. And that's why ethanol blending program started by the government of India. The initial target was that we are going to achieve 10% blending by 2022. The target was November, but we achieved in June. So by, by you know, encouraged by the success, right now India has a target of 20% ethanol blending by 2025. The target here is 2025. Initially, it was 30, but now we have got, we have fast forward the uh, target by five years. Okay. And also remember it is Department of Food and Public Distribution. That is a nodal agency for promoting the fuel grade ethanol producing distilleries in the country. 
Why food in public distribution? Because ultimately it is very important to make sure that we are not going to divert our food grains uh, in more quantities otherwise we will have to suffer from the other problems. Because since, because since ethanol is made by, by the sugar and the starches of course even some, some uh, uh, you know wasted food grains are also diverted for that. But uh, ultimately you have to make sure that ethanol blending is not going to impact the food security of the country. So first third correct the second is wrong. I would say this question is little bit of medium level. Uh, uh, you can still risk it because first and third make sense. The target here is something you have to be good with the facts. So yeah answer has to be B. Okay. Now question number 95 that we have. Question 95 is with respect to the fair remunerative price of the sugar, sugar cane. I am very sure you have heard these two words very commonly MSP and FRP. And given the farmer protest that is, uh, that is going on in India right now, I am sure you are very well aware of these two terms, the minimum support price MSP and the FRP. In India for 22 crops, we, the government gives MSP. And for the sugar cane, a very, very similar kind of protection is given, but by the name of FRP, which is fair and remunerative price for the sugar cane that in India. Uh, right now, sugar cane is the only product for which we have the fair remunerative price. FRP, what exactly FRP and how it is done is something very important that you should know about. So when, it, when you talk about the FRP guys, FRP is basically that particular amount which is payable by the sugar meals for the sugar season. Now please look at that. If I am a farmer and I am growing sugar cane and I have to sell that particular uh, sugar cane, I have to sell it to the sugar meals. So government FR, uh, FRP is basically, now there are two, there is one basic difference. The MSP is something, the price at which government procure. MSP is that minimum support price at which the government has to procure, actually buy from the farmer if the market prices fell down. But in case of FRP, it is not the government. Government only fix the price of the FRP. It is actually the sugar mill owners. They have to pay this minimum amount to the farmer for, for purchasing the sugar cane. That is the difference. MS, MSP is when government itself is paying amount to the farmer for the food grains. But for sugar cane, it is the sugar mill owner that has to pay minimum this much amount for uh, to, uh, to the farmer. But intervention done by the government of India, uh, governments, FRP and MSP, both of them are uh, ba basically uh, the FRP and MSP, both are fixed by the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affair, the recommendations are actually given by Commission on Agriculture Cost and Prices. So CACP is responsible for, for doing all the calculations and recommending, okay, this much, this much has to be the amount of the MSP. But it is the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affair that actually has a final call and it is this that actually announces the MSP and FRP. And to be very uh, careful here that a cabinet committee on economic affairs, it, it looks like as if it, it is under the finance ministry. Cabinet committee on economic affairs is always chaired by the prime minister of India. This is something you really have to be careful about. So it is ultimately the prime minister of India who is going to decide with the help of cabinet committee economic affairs, the, the uh, FRP and MSP in India. Very, very careful. Okay. Now if you look, at, if you go back to the question, so question, you have the answer right in front of you. So FRP, it is approved. I am not talking about the, uh, the recommendation, approval. So CACP is only for the recommendation of the part. It is this cabinet committee on economic affairs that is going to approve it and declare FRP as well as MSP both. Okay. So you never know, you may have a question on the MSP also, which because it is already very much in the news. I think the answer is very easy and something that we all should be aware of because these are very basic questions and something you are supposed to be prepared. Now look at the next question is it is about the MSP only. Now it says the question MSP says MSP for various crops in India decided the word is decided by CACP. I just told you is CACP decided? No. It only recommended deciding part cabinet committee economic affairs, right? The first is not right. 
Intercrop price parity is one of the factor used for the determination of the MSP. Yes, it is one of them. There are many, many factors how you calculate the MSP. Now something because MSP is something which is already in the news. I need to explain to you very simply what exactly MSP is. For example, I'm a farmer and I'm planning to grow my wheat because right now what what is the market rate of the wheat that the market in, at the market uh, the wheat is like let's say 2000 rupees per quintal okay so being a farmer i see okay i should grow the wheat because i'm going to get good uh, price in the market and let us say for some reason uh, by the time i i am done i prepare my crop so by the time of the cultivation let's say for any reason the market price is not no more 2000 and due to any reason now the market price has fallen down to say 1500 rupees per quintal the farmer actually was asking for this price but he is getting only this much price in the market so what is what is uh, what he can do i mean he has only one choice either not to sell or to sell it at 1500 if the farmer is not going to sell the produce it will decay it will rotten down it will it, it is to totally going to be waste so farmer has to make this distress sale the word is called distress sale because farmer is uh, obliged he's he's he is helpless to sell uh, the uh, produce at this now to avoid the, this kind of distress sale and to help the farmer support the farmers government of india twice a year once before the kharif season and once before the rabi season announces msp in india for 22 crops msp is being announced wheat being one of them it is always announced before the cropping season where the government ensures that okay for this particular crop my msp is 1700 rupees per quintal i mean if you are not able to get a better price of it better price than, than that do not have you don't have to sell it before uh, below this level government intervenes and government is going to purchase uh, that uh, uh, crop from the farmer at this particular thing government actually has to procure an, under the msp and that procurement is done by the food corporation of india and then food corporation of india distribute uh, the the crops uh, at its own level okay that is the real process okay when it comes to the F msp calculations you must be you must have heard uh, these days the formula of a2 plus fl what is a2 how msp is calculated msp it says okay this is the to this is the input cost a2 is basically all the input that farmer is putting right now uh, all the seeds fertilizer electricity every input that farmer is producing uh, farmer is putting into the crop fl is the fa family labor if let's say five or ten or members of my family is working in the farm of course you have to calculate that manual effort also there is some family labor because if i am working in my farm i am actually saving some cost so that is again a burden because my my if i have to pay salary to myself then that that cost needs to be added if my 10 family members are working in the farm that means they they are actually contributing to the farmer economy in some way that is also taken into care so right now the a2 plus fl is the total cost let's say uh, uh, you know um, um, 80 rupees is my input cost and uh, 20 rupees is the farmer labor that i am calculating that is that becomes 100 now government says the msp has to be 1.5 times the a2 plus fl means the msp in this case has to be 150 rupees but now the farmers are protesting no the farmers are saying okay this has to be revised this way of calculation has to be revised and now we want the c2 formula c2 formula given by the swaminathan commission 2004 and it says the actual price has to be c2 price c2 is a2 plus fl plus there needs to be one more cost that needs to be added if that particular land is rented or if there is any loan that is on the farmer that interest payment also taken into account so this comprehensive talks about the rent of that land or any interest that farmer has to pay of course this cost cost is going to be more than 100 rupees farmers are demanding c2 right now uh, in this farmer protest okay I, I hope you're getting the point so while calculating the msps while calculating all these figures yes there are lots of uh, factors taken into account all that cost of production input prices input output uh, parity one such is definitely the in enterprise crop parity Okay, I, ho I hope this question is pretty clear to you guys. 
Now in the in the question number 97, the question was with respect to the validity of the self-respect marriages. Very important question. Validity of the self-respect marriages. Now what is this self-respect? Self-respect marriages, uh, just go by the logic. What could be the self-respect marriages? Something where uh, probably you are you are marrying, uh, you know, um, at the odds of your religion, at the odds of your family, you, are, you know, that, that is a kind of self-respect marriage. So what exactly is them? First you need to understand, then you will be in a position to give the answer better. What exactly self-marriages, self-respect marriages are? Recently, Supreme Court upheld the validity of these self-respect marriages. Basically, it's a form of secular and simple marriage, which does not require any ritual or priest, nothing like that. This self-respect marriage law was passed by Tamil Nadu few few years back. And as per this particular marriage, it was basically that, you know, it is not mandatory uh, that you always have to uh, require a priest or the rituals for that sake. And that is where the self-respect marriages, secular marriages were uh, actually promoted in the Tamil Nadu. Well, in this particular self-respect marriages, it said, not every valid, va uh, valid marriage requires a public declaration. When you, when you talk of, of the public declaration, like we have the marriages in general, you always uh, call the guest. There are lots of guests coming, a lot of uh, uh, every ritual is being done. But here, uh, with this special uh, self-respect marriages, since we are doing it, uh, we, are, we are not, uh, we do not have to announce it in public because ultimately why people would do a self-respect marriage? Because ultimately I'm doing it uh, uh, against the wishes of my family and for the sake of safety, I need not to declare it. I need not to make a public declaration of the marriage and that is where we have this uh, particular self-respect marriages. It is why it was actually uh, uh, supported by the court. It was emphasizing that autonomy in choosing the life partner and if society or the state interfere in the marriage, inter-caste or inter-religious marriage, then it is a violation of the fundamental rights of the individual. That is why this was upheld by the Supreme Court. Now, if you look at the questions, you would see, okay, first statement looks absolutely correct. Third is also correct. Second is not correct. Every valid marriage required public declaration. No, this was actually shunned down by, the, struck down by the Supreme Court and it said every valid marriage needs not to be publicly determined or de uh, declared. So answer has to be B. Um, it, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. I, I, I would say um, you, should, you should skip it. Do not risk these kind of questions because uh, you really do not have much scope of applying any or eliminating any option because these are very less talk about topics, not that famous. Now, the next question number 98 is with respect to the National Social Assistance Program called NSAP. Okay, there are few schemes and you have to figure out what uh, that, uh, you know, are they part of National Social Assistance or not? Let us say you are not well aware and you are now in a problematic situation. You have to choose which, which, which scheme is a part of National Social Assistance or not. First, what think about what National Social Assistance can be. Well, when I talk about the term social assistance, social assistance means, means what? I'm talking about some welfare, right? I'm talking about some giving security. I'm going to assist the poor people of the country, something like that, right? So social assistance means some welfare, security, something to offer to the poor people, especially who are below poverty line. So if you have this much, this much uh, thing in your head, what social assistance could be, now read the five and you will get the answer. If I have to socially support someone, which scheme I do, I do require? Indira Gandhi old age pension, yes, it is about giving social security. Indira Gandhi national widow pension, it will again give a social assistance to the widow, widow of, of the country. National disability pension scheme, yes, we want to make the things more inclusive. National family benefit scheme, yes, it is and the Annapurna scheme which is about the food security, isn't it? So just by understanding, you don't, you don't have to be champion of these five schemes. You just have to apply the common sense, figure out, find out what this assistance program can be all about. And I will give my, I'll get my answer. It's a medium question I would say, but I should attempt it. Understanding the requirement of the question, answer has to be D, all five in this particular case. Now to give you a bit more information, yes, 
the National Social Assistance uh, Program. It is a social security welfare program launched 1995 by Ministry of Rural Development. Now the ministries is something you have to be a bit more careful. Ministries are always important guys. And this particular National Social Assistance Program was actually for the sake of those people who are below poverty line. That is one, one major criteria. The beneficiary has to be a person belonging to BPL category. And there are five schemes for that. And of course, every scheme, every scheme has its own uh, uh, provisions. Like for example, in Annapurna, it is about the food security I told you. Family benefit is going to talk about uh, in case by chance there is a death of the, of, of the person uh, giving or earning all the money. Then of course, the 20,000 sum will be awarded to the household, something like that. It is gi being given, right? You can read the details of the in, in into the PDF there is nothing much to explain but I'm ask but I'm telling you the approach how we can solve it then the question number 99 is with respect to the African lion and the Asiatic lion don't 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 get worried about these bigger names they are just to make you a little bit confusing that's all so the main gist is I have to compare the African lion with the Asia Asiatic lion okay let's say I have no idea so please apply a common sense. If I have to compare Asiatic line with the African line, African line is always going to be bigger and stronger. Why? Africa has the, the, the best wildlife you can think of. African environment, climatic conditions is there. And in Africa, Africa has savannas, which is, which is called the, the adobe of the wildlife. No, So African lines are always going to be bigger. The first statement. African lion is generally smaller, doesn't suit the real nature of African lions. Africans are always, you know, bigger. Be, be, it the, be it the human, the human beings or the animals, they're always going to be, they have bigger, stronger genetics, right? So African lions are not smaller, they're always bigger uh, and stronger than the Asiatic lion. So first statement is definitely wrong. And then it says the IUCN status of both are endangered. Um, I do not see African and Asiatic to be falling. I don't know about if they are endangered or not, but at least I'm very sure, I'm very sure that both don't lie at the same level. Some, somebody has to be more critical than the other. Of course, both are not because again, African lions are not in, into that bad state as the Asiatic lions. So both are not, need not to be same at the conservation level. At least I can think about these two, right? These two looks a bit wrong to me. Now, let's see if I can get the right answer. Okay, at least at least these kind of logical things you can think of. So like I told you and the line to be to be uh, very uh, to, to tell you very some, something very interesting. Lion is the second largest cat species in the world, which is the largest one, the tiger. The tiger is the largest cat species. Then we have the lion. Then third one, we have the jaguar and fourth are the leopards. Lions has two subspecies the African and the Asiatic lines and then you have the distribution in front of you the African lines like I told you they are bigger than the Asiatic ones uh, distribution wise the African the African lines you will find in sub-Saharan Africa and West Africa whereas the Asiatic are mainly found in the Gir National Park in, in fact in India uh, Gir National Park is the only area it is the only place in India where the lions are found in their natural habitat Gir National Park, Gujarat is the only natural habitat of the lions that we have in, in, in India. And again, when it comes to the IUCN status, I told you, both are not going to be in the same category. Asiatic are endangered. The Africans are still vulnerable. They are still in, in a better category than ours. Okay, isn't it? So if you go back to the question, I would say, I would say this question was easy for me. Why? Because I, I was in a position to apply some common sense here. And you must, must attempt this question with one, two being correct, one and three being incorrect. Answer has to be A, one only. And now we have the last question of the day. The last question that we have is about the question number 100. The last question says, which of the following statement is not correct? Very careful guys. The question says, which of the following statement is not correct? Okay. Now the question is about the great Nicobar Island and it was in news because there, there, there is, there is a, a project going to be, uh, there is a construction project which was there, uh, which was announced for, the, for this particular uh, area. The, now, look, first you have to be careful about why it was in the news. 
so national commission for scheduled tribes recently flagged their uh, discrepancies and they uh, they objected to the to the very uh, unfamous uh, kind of project that was announced by the government which is great nicobar island project about developing and constructing lot of new infrastructure on the great nicobar island of our of our country and the government is now planning to create uh, international corridor trans transshipment terminal green field international airport solar uh, gas plants township lot of things are going to be there but the concerns are because this particular area the great nicobar island area is tectic is tectonically a sensitive zone and that is one of the reasons why this particular group why this particular area the great nicobar island is declared as a biosphere reserve in 1989 it is also part of unesco man biosphere reserve because the area is very sensitive and why the government is going to give this area under the construction make absolutely no sense and again the sec the uh, another thing that you have to be careful about this great nicobar island it is also a designated tribal reserve of india and this designation was done under andaman nicobar protection of ab original tribal regulation 1956 why it was done because on the island of great nicobar we have two very specific isolated indigenous tribes one being shampan another being nicobaris shampan are very important for us because it is one of the particularly vulnerable tribal group of india in in india there are 75 pvtgs and one of them is the shampan that we have now if you read the question guys if you look at the question which was asked the last question of the day now this question was with respect to the islands first statement says this was declared biosphere reserve included in unesco man biosphere reserve yes it is this statement is correct right and second says and the second statement says the island designated tribal reserve but but the problem is with this act we have just told you it is the andaman andaman nicobar act 1956 under which the tribe is the island is a tribal reserve not the forest right so this second statement looks wrong because i have to figure out not correct the first one is correct the second one is not correct answer has to be now i think this was a, a medium kind of question you can still risk it but i mean of course you have to be more careful the second statement is something that can trouble you so if you are not willing to take that risk then you can skip otherwise you can take a bit of risk in, into that so these were the 100 questions that we have done i hope uh, the test number 2 you really have enjoyed and uh, do let me know your your feedback do let me know how you enjoyed and what specifically you enjoyed the most and you learned the most i'm waiting for the comments i always read the comments that you put into the comment section box this is ashish malik ending the test number 2 best wishes for your upsc 2024 and do check out our test series the link is given in the comment box do take those test because they are going to improve the score in your upcoming exams all my best wishes take care god bless you see you guys in test number 3 jai hind